So this Advent season, this Christmas season, we've been spending time looking at these first two chapters of Matthew's gospel, Matthew's account of the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so far, we've seen how the Apostle Matthew has set out to answer the question, who is Jesus? Matthew gave us that genealogy at the very beginning. He showed us how Jesus is the rightful king from David's line. He's, the, he's a, a true Jew. He's descended from Abraham. He's the divine son of God in human form. He's born of Mary, but not of Joseph. He's shown how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, the one who would come to save his people from their sins, the one who would reconcile people from every tribe and nation and tongue with God. And then last week, we saw Matthew's account of the visit of the wise men, those Persian astrologers from so far away who came to visit the infant Jesus, how that further displayed God's grace and his glory in unexpected ways, but it also posed a very real threat to Herod, the Idumean, the false king, the puppet king of Rome, the the fake king of the Jews. And so today, we're going to see what happened next. And just like before, we're going to have to take a little bit of time to dig into the history here. We're going to have to find out what was happening in that ancient world because that's how we have to understand what exactly is going on in these few verses. Remember, Matthew assumes that his readers are familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, with the Jewish traditions, the Jewish culture, and all the names and the events. Uh, Just like you and I might talk about politics or sports and use a name or a reference as shorthand for an entire series of events or people, Matthew does the same thing here. And so we need to do this in order to understand, and most importantly, to understand what Matthew and what God, through Matthew's pen, was expecting his original readers and so us to understand about who Jesus is. Because just like before, like we've been saying, there's so much more going on here than just a story. The whole point of this passage, and and of so many others as well, is not merely for us to know what happened to Jesus, but for us to understand who Jesus is, that we may believe, and by believing, have life in his name. So let's read together. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 13 and going all the way through the end of the chapter. The Apostle Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Father, I pray, open our hearts and our minds to your word by your Holy Spirit. May we receive it, may we understand it better, may we know your Son, Jesus Christ, through it. May we see him more clearly and love him more dearly. Amen. So Matthew has already given us one way that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecy in chapter 2. We saw it last week. We saw that through those unlikely circumstances, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, just as the prophet Micah had foretold. Now, this passage today, it unfolds in three sections, and in each section, at each stage of the way, Matthew gives us another way that Jesus fulfills prophecy. 
But again, these happen in unexpected ways. And Matthew's definition of fulfilling prophecy is probably a little bit different than what you might have in mind. So let's dive in. The first thing we see is the escape. The escape. Verse 13, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So again, just like in the first part of chapter 2, here Joseph is again visited by an angel and given instructions, this time to flee, to run. Remember, the wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, not to return to Jerusalem. And as far as we know, they managed to return to their own country safely without encountering Herod or his forces. Remember also that Bethlehem is not far from Jerusalem, only about six miles to the south-southwest. Uh, uh, it, it would not have taken very long for word to reach Jerusalem from Bethlehem and the surrounding regions that the wise men had departed, and they had decided not to return to Jerusalem. And so Herod would not have wasted any time, once he heard that news, in mustering his soldiers. He would have been enraged, certainly at the wise men, yes, for what he perceived as their falsehood and their deceit, but he didn't send his soldiers after them. Remember, he was a false king, and more than that, Herod knew that he was a false king. He had no real claim to the throne, and so Herod knew where the threat to his power was, and it wasn't with the wise men. The lives of Jesus and Mary and Joseph were now in very real danger, and so they had to leave, and that's, of course, what they did. Verse 14, and he, Joseph, he rose, took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt, and he remained there until the death of Herod. Joseph is so marked for his obedience in this chapter, isn't he? Joseph, in the first part, he immediately obeyed God's angelic messenger not to divorce Mary uh, and in naming the child Jesus, and here again, he obeys God right away. Without question. He sets out at, at night, of course, to avoid unnecessary attention, to flee. He became a fugitive. That's actually where the word fugitive comes from. It's from the Greek word here. He set out on a long journey to find a safe place. As a side note, I think it's important to mention this. It's become very popular today to say that Jesus was a refugee. I don't think we should use that term. I don't think that's the way we should describe it. And the reason is that all too often people take that term refugee, which is so loaded with cultural and with political baggage, and then try to leverage that into advocating for specific political policies, which sometimes line up with God's word, sometimes do not. The issue here is not the issue of those specific political policies, but in making sure that we handle God's word rightly. We do not dare to read our own cultural moment back into the Bible. We need to do the exact opposite. We must resist that temptation. We must resist the temptation to put our own lenses on and to read the Bible. We have to instead have the Bible become our lenses through which we see our world, right? It can be very subtle, but it's an important difference. We have to do the diligent work to understand what the original authors were saying to the original audiences in order to understand that God is telling us that same message today, and not only to us, but to everyone, every culture, every language around the world, in every time and every place. God's word does not change. Jesus was a fugitive from a wicked king, and so his earthly father, Joseph, took him somewhere safe, but somewhere unexpected. He took him to Egypt. Egypt, of course, was one of Israel's great historical enemies, weren't they? Any mention of Egypt in reference to the people of Israel, for us, probably makes us think of what? The Exodus, right? The Exodus, slavery in Egypt, and then Moses leading the people out by God's power and mercy. That's a good connotation to have. We're on the right track if we have that connotation, thinking of Egypt. Matthew's Jewish readers certainly would have had that connotation, it's a good point of connection, then, that we today have with them all those years ago. But at this point in time, when Jesus was an infant, Egypt was not an enemy of Israel. They were both subjects, rather, to the Roman Empire. During those 400 silent years between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, Alexander the Great who swept through the entire world, he had established a city in Egypt, a safe haven for the Jews. You've probably heard of it. He named it after himself. It was the city of Alexandria. 
famous for its library, famous for the scholars that that library attracted from all over the known world. It was in that city, the city of Alexandria, that the Jewish scholars, about 300 years before Jesus was born, they translated the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language what we call the Septuagint. And that translation was the translation that Jesus himself used, that the disciples used, that the early church used, that the New Testament writers almost always use when they quote the Old Testament. They use that version produced in Alexandria in Egypt. Egypt was a safe haven for Jewish people at that time. And that's where God's messenger directed Joseph to take Mary and the infant Jesus to Egypt. Well, eventually, of course, Herod died, and they returned to the land of Israel. We'll look at that in uh, more detail in just a moment. But Matthew here in verse 15 tells us that this was to fulfill prophecy. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Again, some of Matthew's themes in his gospel are showing Jesus as the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of God. Sonship is a big deal for Matthew. And here he references the second part of what we know as Hosea, the prophet Hosea, chapter 11 and verse 1, which says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That doesn't really sound like a prophecy, though, does it? It doesn't sound like Hosea was writing about the future coming of the Messiah. But Matthew, here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us that's exactly what it was. Hosea originally was clearly referencing the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt in that exodus by God's power. And all throughout the Old Testament, Israel is very often referred to as God's son, God's beloved son. So what Matthew is saying, what God is telling us here is not that Hosea was explicitly thinking of the Messiah, but rather Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the true Son of God in every way. Everything that Israel was supposed to do, Jesus did. Everything that Israel was supposed to be, Jesus was and is. Where Israel failed in every way, Jesus succeeded in every way. And this this is crucial. This is crucial to understand this. This is not only crucial to understand Matthew's gospel, but to understand the whole Old Testament To understand who Jesus is. Jesus is the true and better Israel. Jesus is God's true son. And so in this way, Matthew tells us that Jesus' escape to Egypt is a fulfillment of prophecy. The second part of the, the account here involves the slaughter. The slaughter, beginning in verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Herod already had a reputation for cruelty, but at this point in his life, he outdid himself. As we talked about last week, when those wise men came, Jesus may have been anywhere from a few months to two years old, and this is why Herod, who became furious... Herod became very enraged, your translation may say. Herod, who was now controlled by his blinding and violent rage, this is why he went to the town of Bethlehem or sent troops there and mercilessly slaughtered all the male children who were two years old or under. As I was discussing this passage with my wife this week, she asked me, why do you think God didn't stop Herod? Why did all those children have to die? That's a good question. The short answer is, I don't know. I don't know. God does not reveal to us what could have happened, beloved. But God in his word reveals to us what did happen. And what he does tell us is that we live in a world where everything and everyone has been tainted with sin. And the stark reality is that it's only because of his mercy and grace that there are not more Herods out there. God also reveals to us that evil is real. Evil is real. Evil is not a popular word today, is it? The concepts of right and wrong have been marginalized and relativized and individualized so that they're, they're basically meaningless anymore. Everyone has their truth. They have to live out their own truth. 
And so to call something evil today is to invoke an objective standard outside of someone's self. To call something evil is to invoke a divine law and a divine law giver. And people don't want to hear that. Our world today will do anything to avoid hearing that message, let alone acknowledging it and let alone to submitting to it and to the one who gives the law. Evil is real. The coming of Jesus, the Messiah, the King, into the world posed a very real threat to a very evil man. And that evil man utilized every resource at his disposal to try to achieve his satanic goal. Remember, Herod knew who Jesus was. He knew. When the wise men showed up at his palace, he asked the priests and the scribes where the Messiah was to be born. He told the wise men that he wanted to go and worship him. He knew Jesus was the true king. He knew Jesus was God in human flesh. And so what we read here, this is more than just the insane action of a paranoid tyrant. No, this was the work of Satan himself through the means of an evil king who hated God. Evil is real. Opposition to God, opposition to Jesus Christ, opposition to the gospel will have real-world ramifications, beloved. Wicked rulers execute innocent people. God-hating tyrants slaughter helpless children. And all of this is because of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Jesus himself told us to expect this. In, in Matthew chapter 10, he said, I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. The gospel of Jesus Christ, you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the single most divisive message in all of human history. Nothing else comes close. The gospel, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't exist with no relation to our everyday lives. It doesn't exist with no relation to the actions of God's enemies. People all over the world are still placing their lives in danger, being killed for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. We must be prepared to recognize demonic opposition to Jesus Christ, even in our world today, that scoffs at the very idea of demons and demonic activity. It's real. We have to have our eyes open. But Matthew then tells us that even this heinous act was a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Here, Matthew is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 15. And in that passage, again, Jeremiah isn't giving us a specific prophecy about the future coming of the Messiah, but rather what he was doing in that original script, in that original text, was warning the people of Judah about the impending destruction by Babylon. Babylon came in. They destroyed the city. They slaughtered countless people. They carried off the best and brightest into exile. The town mentioned here, the town of Ramah, is another small town, not that different from Bethlehem. It's about five miles north of Jerusalem. And of course, Rachel, Rachel was the wife of Jacob, Jacob who was also called Israel. In Jeremiah, Rachel is the figurative mother of the people of Israel. She was weeping due to the death and destruction of the children of Israel. How many Jewish mothers wept and wailed as their sons were slaughtered or carried off into exile by Babylon? And how many Jewish mothers wept and wailed that day as Satan's minion Herod marauded and killed his way through the streets of Bethlehem? And so Matthew, again, is drawing out this idea that Jesus is the true Israel, the true Son of God. Just as Israel came out of Egypt, so did Jesus. Just as Israel survived despite a massive slaughter by an evil and demonic oppressor, so did Jesus. Jesus surviving this slaughter of the innocents is a fulfillment of prophecy. Well, third and finally, then, we see the return, beginning in verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. 
of Israel. Once again, an angel comes to Joseph, gives him instruction, and once again, Joseph obeys. We don't know exactly how long they lived in Egypt. It was probably anywhere from two to four years. We know from other historical works that Herod, called Herod the Great, died about 1 B.C. And by the way, he died in a very graphic, extreme, painful way. If you Google the death of Herod the Great, you can find all the information. It's quite disgusting. That's from the historian Josephus, by the way. You see, God's enemies might seem to escape justice for a while, right? But not for long. Not forever. They can't evade the righteous judge of all the universe. Herod died. The primary threat to young Jesus' life was removed. And so Joseph set out to take his family back to his homeland. But there was still one more change of plans yet. Verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. Again, all these names, all these places would have been familiar to Matthew's original readers. They would have understood all the connotations and all the baggage that all these words and names claimed. We don't necessarily have that, so let's look behind the scenes a little bit. Herod the Great, quote unquote, he had many children with multiple women. He lived a fairly long time for those days. And as with so many other pagan kings, he was very paranoid about who would rule after him about the security of his own rule, about his legacy. So he actually changed his will, his rule of succession, on at least one occasion. Uh, A few years before Jesus was born, he had two of his own sons executed. And then later, uh, shortly before he himself died, he executed another son, Antipater, who was in line for the throne. He executed him on charges of conspiracy to murder. And then he himself died five days later. And as a result, Herod's kingdom was then split into three parts, similar to how after Alexander the Great died, his massive kingdom was split into four parts. Here, Herod's very small kingdom was split into three parts, split between his three remaining sons, Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus, who's mentioned here. Now, he's mentioned here as reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod. We know from other extra-biblical sources, Archelaus was given the regions of Judea, which is where Jerusalem was located. He was also given Samaria, which we know from other New Testament passages. It was just to the north. Samaria was the home of those descendants who intermarried with the Babylonians during the exile. The pure-blood Jews viewed them as half-breeds, as unclean, as not worthy of coming to the temple. Archelaus was also given Idumea to the southwest, which is the home of Herod's people. Remember, they're the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. And already, Archelaus, at this point, had developed another reputation for cruelty, just like his father, and possibly even more so. In fact, shortly after Herod's death, there was another revolution in Jerusalem. Remember, the political climate was was a tinderbox at the time. There was a political revolution in Jerusalem when Jesus was an infant. And so what did Archelaus do? He slaughtered 3,000 people in the streets of Jerusalem. And not only that, he did this during the Passover feast. Most of the people he slaughtered were innocent travelers who had come there to celebrate the Passover, not involved in any kind of political uprising. But Archelaus did not care. He cared only for uh, exercising and solidifying his rule, and so he slaughtered people in the streets of Jerusalem on Passover. And so conditions in Bethlehem, which was in Judea, had not improved for Joseph and his family. But even, of course, all this was still in God's sovereign plan. Joseph, again, is is warned. This time he's warned in a dream against returning to Bethlehem, the city of David, where he had evidently planned on staying with his young family. And instead he goes north. He goes to the district of Galilee. Galilee was even farther north than Samaria. That region went to another one of Herod's sons, known as Herod Antipas, And he was not the violent tyrant that his brother Archelaus was. It was safe for the family to settle there, but it came with a price. Galilee was the home mostly of Gentiles and country folk, bumpkins, uneducated people. That's where Joseph took the child Jesus, a city called Nazareth. The city of Nazareth isn't mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. It's not mentioned in any other extra-biblical historical literature from that time. It was nowhere. It was a nothing town. 
It was full of people who had never done anything, people who had never achieved anything at any time in their history. The Apostle John in his gospel records for us a saying that was common in Jesus' time, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a punchline. It was a joke. Nazareth was shorthand for worthlessness. But God, in his infinite, his unexpected wisdom and sovereignty, he has the young Jesus settle in this utterly insignificant town, far away from the temple and the priests and the city of kings. And Matthew tells us that even this was to fulfill prophecy. He settled in the city called Nazareth so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. A Nazarene means someone from the city of Nazareth. We're not talking about a Nazarite, if you might remember the story of Samson, who uh, was on strict dietary rules and was forbidden to cut his hair. That's not what we're talking about here. A Nazarene is just someone from the town of Nazareth. Well, so far in chapter 2, Matthew has quoted these Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Jeremiah, But this reference is different. There's no place in the Old Testament where any prophet says anything like, the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene, or the Messiah shall live in Nazareth. It doesn't doesn't exist. You won't find it. But remember that what Matthew has been doing is not only giving us these explicit prophecies about Jesus, but he's also giving us what we call types. Types. Foreshadowings. Hints of things to come, events and writings that were not originally conceived by their human authors to refer to Jesus, but that Jesus nevertheless fulfills because he is God's true son. He is the true and better Israel. And in the same way, while this is not an explicit Old Testament quotation, the, uh, the testimony of the Old Testament is unanimous. And it's all through the Old Testament that the Messiah would be humble. He would be lowly. He would be despised and rejected of men. He would be scorned and mocked. He would be rejected and abhorred and abused by his own people. He would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His home place of his home, his place of birth, the town of Bethlehem, was lowly and ignored, and his hometown now of Nazareth was even more so. His hometown was synonymous was with worthlessness, and the term Nazarenes was even used as a term of condescension, as an insult to Jesus' followers in Acts chapter 24. Remember, nobody at the time was looking for someone to save them from their sins. And even if they were, it certainly would not have been Jesus, a child born out of wedlock, a child from a kingly line which was long bereft of prestige and glory, a child who lived in a backwater town in a remote region filled with nobodies ruled by a third-rate scion of a cruel king. But that's where God brought them. That's where God brought Joseph and Mary, the man and the woman that were chosen to raise Jesus the Messiah. Jesus coming from Nazareth fulfills prophecy. So a passage like this, we have to ask, what do we take away from this? What do we do with this? What's the point of Matthew telling us these things? Like everything he's told us so far, it's, it's so much more than just recounting information or telling us a story. Matthew wants us to understand who Jesus is is. And so here are three things, three things that I think we need to take away from this passage. First, Jesus is the true and better Israel, but he's also the true and better Moses. Now, Moses hasn't been mentioned explicitly in this passage, but he's there. Earlier, we saw just a hint of it when he mentioned Egypt. We should instantly think of the Exodus and Moses. This is really, really important for us to get this connotation. Jesus is the true and better Israel, but he's the true and better Moses. And we're going to come back to this more and more as we go through Matthew's gospel. Just take a moment and think about some of the parallels between the life of Moses and the life of Jesus. In their infancy, an evil king tried to have them killed. That evil king indiscriminately murdered all the male children under a certain age. Remember when Moses was threatened to be thrown into the Nile. The child then had to be hidden away from the evil king. Joseph and Mary fleeing, Moses put into the basket. They were sent away from their own people to live among the Egyptians for their safety. 
Jesus went, fled to Egypt with his family for safety. Uh, Moses w- went to live among the family of Pharaoh and his daughter. They were raised by an adoptive parent. Joseph was not Jesus' biological father, but he dutifully and gladly obeys the Lord at every step of the way, caring for the infant Messiah. And we're going to see more of these parallels as well as we go through the gospel. We'll draw out those implications passage by passage as we go along. But for now, we need to see that Matthew is signaling to us in no uncertain terms that Jesus is God's true son, not only the Davidic king, the Abrahamic Messiah, but also the true and better Moses. The true and better Israel, God's perfect son. Well, secondly, evil, as we've talked about already, evil has real-world consequences. We tend to think of evil as abstract because right and wrong, it's been abstracted, as we said before. Evil has kind of been relegated to the realm of cartoons or movie villains, things that are up on a screen. But even there, there's been a trend over the last 20 years of deconstructing movie villains even. Remaking movie villains so that they're not really evil, they're just misunderstood. They're the result of some personal trauma or they're the result of someone else's actions or the result of society itself. The trend in our culture. But evil is very real. Of course, Paul tells us that our struggle against evil is not ultimately against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. We'll see that when we go back to Ephesians and look at chapter 6. But spiritual evil still has very real effects in the physical world. Herod slaughtering those children was just a taste of the death and destruction that our old enemy Satan wants to unleash upon us, upon God's people. And the people of Israel then experienced it again. A few years later, in the year 70 AD, the city was destroyed by Rome. More death, more destruction. And there will still be more to come. At the end, when Antichrist has his reign of terror and wreaks violence against God's people, evil is always threatened by the presence of the holy, the presence of the king of kings, or even by the presence of his people. We must be vigilant. We must never marginalize the reality of evil. We must strive to have our feet firmly planted on the rock-solid foundation of the word of God. Evil has real-world consequences. But third, the gospel of Jesus Christ, praise God, the gospel also has real-world consequences. Just like evil is not merely an abstract concept that's unrelated to anything happening in the real world, so too the gospel is not merely some abstract concept of our relationship with God that has no bearing on how we live on life itself. Yes, the gospel has implications for our actions, for our minds, for our patterns of thought. If we are in Christ, right, uh, we are to live like Christ. We've been looking at that back in Ephesians. But if we are in Christ, beloved, if we are in Christ, then we should also expect the world to react to us the same way it reacted to Christ. We think about this a lot more other times of the year, don't we? Especially Easter in the Lenten season. Jesus, of course, was despised and rejected. He was abused and scorned and crucified. But the world's rejection of him didn't extend to just him alone. It extended to his followers, his friends, his family, and even innocent children who happened to live in the same town as him. Evil is real. Evil hates God. Evil people hate God's people. Evil people will stop at nothing to destroy not only the king, but all the king's people. The spirit of Herod, the spirit of Antichrist, the spiritual forces of evil that array themselves against Jesus Christ and all who are in him, these forces are in the world today. They still seek to destroy God's people, both spiritually and physically. So be on your guard, beloved. Be on your guard. But take heart. For just as Herod eventually died, Joseph eventually brought his family back to Israel. Just as God eventually brought his people out of slavery from under Pharaoh, so too God will eventually triumph over Satan, over his minions, over his earthly agents. We're fighting a war, but the good news is that we're not fighting it alone. Jesus, the Nazarene, 
Jesus, the true Israel. Jesus, the true and better Moses. Jesus, God's perfect son. Jesus, Emmanuel. God is with us to the very end of the age. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you did not leave us alone to fight against the forces of evil, but you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into the world so that we would be forgiven of our sin, that we would be brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that we would be given your Holy Spirit to live within us, to empower us and to enable us to stand firmly, stand against evil and stand for you. And so give us eyes to see the glory and greatness of Jesus Christ the true and better Israel, the true and better Moses, that we may see him here in the pages of your word. May we live each day rejoicing in the truth that Jesus Christ is indeed your perfect son and that if we are in him, we no longer, we no longer lead, need to live in fear, fear of evil, for he has conquered in his body on the cross. And so it is in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen.